Welcome to The Perspective with Mike Sherboneau, your host for all seasons through this journey called life, and a pastor who, along with his wife, Terry, has planted churches from coast to coast to coast for more than 40 years. Of course, he started when he was just seven. In all seriousness, prayer is at the center of Mike and Terry's incredible church planting. And today, Linda Evans Shepherd from Got to Pray is here. Linda shows us how prayer, even when we cannot find the words, it's okay, and how when we pray, allows God to hear us, shape us, and transform our lives, even when we tire of praying for a miracle or don't know what to say. Linda is an award-winning author, speaker, radio personality whose 18-month-old daughter was severely injured in a car accident on the freeway and was in a year-long coma. When placed beside her newborn baby brother, her daughter awoke. With her incredible story and God-given spirit from Longmont, Colorado, welcome Linda Evans Shepherd. Well, welcome to The Perspective. Uh, I'm Mike Sherboneau, and I got a special co-host today, Michelle Wegman. Michelle, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks so much for having Are me. Are you sure you're up to it? Yes, I'm ready for the challenge. Okay, <laughs> and I won't give you too much of a hard time, okay. but uh, when I say that, you know, sometimes it comes back to haunt me. <laughs> so uh, you're well married to a guy named... Matt. Okay, yes. I just wanted to make sure you knew his name. Yeah, I remembered it. You remember it? <laughs> and you have a young daughter, Addison. I do. I have a daughter, an eight-year-old. Yes. Where, where'd you get the name Addison? Well, I actually saw it in a book when I was much younger, and I it stuck with me, and I remembered it. And even though it's not named after the Grey's Anatomy character, but... <laughs> Okay. And you have five daughters, so you must have lots of stories of where their names came from. Lots of stories. We got them from all sorts of places. Yeah. People wanting to, uh, you know, put their opinion on us. Yeah. The best one, one name came off a tombstone. So oh. anyways, <laughs> we won't go into that, okay? But what do you do for fun when you're not at home? Tell us about um, that. Well, yeah, when I'm not at home, I'm, I'm teaching and um, I'm performing. I'm a singer, so I love to do that. And uh, teaching is a big passion of mine, too. Can you so dance a little bit, singer, dancer? I can dance, yes. I can't, I can't I'm, dance. <laughs> my Maybe wife, I my you. daughters have told me that. <laughs> yeah. You used to perform on cruise ships as well. I did, yes, yeah. Okay. So I have a lot of uh, experience performing on stages everywhere, all over the country and all over the world. Well, if we get a blank moment, I'm just going to point to you and say, please start singing. Okay. <laughs> but someone who has learned to sing and has incredible joy and has written just recently a book on joy again is our amazing guest. And uh, we have Linda Evans Shepherd with us today. And so I just want to welcome you, Linda. Thanks for being with us. I am so glad to be here with you, Mike and well, Michelle. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you saying that. Do you mean it? Are you really glad to be with us? <laughs> you bet I am. You betcha. <laughs> <laughs> well, we saw a little glimpse at the beginning, but maybe as a starting point, uh, maybe you could give us the short version of your miracle with your daughter, as we heard in the intro. Want to hear about that? Well, my beautiful daughter was in a terrible car accident, and her car seat was thrown into the freeway, and she spent the next year of her life in coma. Wow. And I waited on God. I waited for Laura. And when we put her newborn baby brother in her arms, when he came home from the hospital, that was the moment she woke up and she came back to us. And oh, did we have fun here in this very room. This was her room. And today she has transitioned into heaven and I can't even imagine the joy she must have. Wow, what an amazing thing. I know Michelle's got burning with a question right now. Yeah, in your introduction, Linda, you said that trusting God is the best path to a joy that endures. So can you explain how does that work? Well, uh, here's the problem. When you are trying to carry all your burdens on your own shoulders, you are gonna get tired, you're gonna get cranky, you're gonna get anxious, fearful, but when you say, hey, God, do you see all these problems I have? They're your problems. You figure them out. That is actually the prayer of trust. And then you can relax because you know God is up to something. He is busy turning that problem into a miracle you might not even be able to imagine. 
And so trusting God releases you to enjoy God's presence. Yeah, you wrote actually, Linda, that prayer is a necessity even when we have no words. So can you expand a little more on that? Absolutely. We have to always stay, even when we are crying to the Lord and we don't even know what to say or just even sitting quietly with him and just so overwhelmed, he hears us. The Holy Spirit interprets that into the prayer that God will answer. So even our cries are actually prayers. You know, I was thinking as you're talking about prayer, if, uh, if I say to somebody that I pray to God and he hears me, they can, they can kind of get their head around that. But when I tell them that I hear God speak to me, I mean, they think I'm uh, schizophrenic or, you know, I've got multiple personalities and we <laughs> want to pull back. Even many Christians are uncomfortable with the whole concept that God speaks to us and he speaks to us through his word. Uh, but he threw impressions in the heart through people speaking to us. When you were going through some very dark times, and I know you've gone through those things, how did God speak to you? Well, first off, Mike, I don't think we need to worry about the other people wondering about us. Let him wonder about us. We have the Lord, and he does speak to us, and we can hear his still quiet voice. We hear it the best when we're reading the word. And when we bring a problem and we're reading the word, the word is alive, full of the spirit of God, and it will speak to us. And then on those difficult days, I just had a very difficult day a couple of days ago, and I quietly sat before the Lord, and suddenly he said, I've got it. You can be assured. You can rest in me. And so what a relief that is that we can hear God in that way. So how did you know that God said to you, you know, I've got it? Was it a sense in your heart? Was it a voice you heard in your head? Was it a scripture that you were reading? Well, in this particular case, I was crying out to the Lord quietly. And it was suddenly I felt his presence. And when I did, he spoke in my heart, not in my ears, not out loud, but just a quiet, I've got it. And then I felt the assurance of his presence on that. And I knew that was the voice of God. That's wonderful. Can you tell us about how God makes the impossible possible every day? Yeah, I want to hear about that. He absolutely does that. And how could we even manage through this life? I don't know how people do it. Well, I was talking to someone who has no concept of God's love for them and they're angry, bitter, and they have no way to call out and reach out. But we can. We can say, God, I need a miracle. We can say, God, I don't know how to handle this, but you do. And we can say, God, I'm giving this to you, and I cannot wait to see what you're going to do with it. And he can turn, flip our situation from what we would call evil back to good because we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength, and we know that he works out all things for the good. Okay, so let's build on that phrase, because I love that verse when you say it works out all things for the good. As I understand the text, it's not necessarily my good, but it's God's good. But when I'm delighting myself in the Lord, I mean, his good is, is the best good, if I can say it that way. You went through a difficult time, I mean, many times, even this past week, but let's talk about the accident way back. And your daughter's in a, in a coma for almost a year, or at least a year. You were praying for a miracle. I didn't even know you then, but I knew you'd be praying for that miracle. I understand that. And it didn't happen on your time when she would wake up. So what do you say to people who are praying for miracles, but don't receive them? Well, first off, we are not God. We love God. We know that God loves us, but he's the almighty and he operates in his own timing. He does things his own way for purpose, for reason, for miracles, and out of love for us. 
And I know that's hard to understand when you're going through a hard time. If you had tapped me on the shoulder and said to me back in that day, uh, especially the day that I had the 20 healthcare professionals surround me and tell me that my daughter would be a vegetable forever until she was 80 years old. If you had tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, Linda, this is just going to all be fine. God's going to use it. I wouldn't have believed you. But yet, who else did I have to go to? Who else can we turn to? Who else loves us the way God does? Who else has given us promises that he can make all things work for the good of those who love him? God, he's the one. I didn't have a choice and there was no way I was going to look in any direction but at the love of God. Yeah, thank you so much, Linda. Stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back. Well, hey, I'm back right now with uh, our co-host, Michelle Wegman and Linda Evans-Shepard. And Linda, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, too. Yeah, and Michelle, I'm really glad you're here as well. So that's uh, otherwise it'd be pretty lonely here for me <laughs> sitting here talking to myself. But that's OK, because um, I, I like to think I'm good company anyways. <laughs> so all that aside, I like to laugh. I like to smile, Linda. And it's been said, what use is a Christian who has no joy? Um, expand on that for us, because you've had a lot of things that should have robbed you of joy. How did you claim it? How did you find it? Well, Nehemiah said when he was rebuilding the wall, and he did it in 52 days, he said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And as I imagine him working away with his men, trying to build that wall around Jerusalem, I think of all the trouble and problems that I've had in my own life, but yet the joy. And where does that come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It says in Galatians 5 that we have the fruit of the Spirit, and joy is one of my very favorite fruits of the Spirit. And we need that because when we have the joy of the Lord, we can overcome. In fact, uh, Mueller, George Mueller, who took care of orphans in the 1800s in Bristol, England, there was a terrible, a terrible pandemic, and these children didn't have any place to go. They were on the streets, and God tapped him to care for these orphans. And in his lifetime, he cared for 10,000 orphans, but yet he never asked for a penny. He was able to trust God through faith because he would spend time over his Bible every morning until he read the word and prayed himself happy. And that's what we can do too. We can pray ourselves happy and go out there with the joy of the Lord. And that will increase our faith. That will increase our patience and our strength and even our kindness. <laughs> I, love that. I know I know Michelle has a question, but I'm just thinking something kind of crazy here. You talked about this guy, George Mueller, and he inspired me, you know, even at times when he would pray and there would be no food. And then by the time he'd finish praying, the food would be at the door to feed hundreds of children. And uh, my goodness, you know, the other day we were going to a meeting and we stopped at, uh, at the coffee shop and I ordered uh, two boxes of 50 Timbits, little donuts. And the lady said, sir, next time, will you make sure that you order in advance? And I'm thinking, ah, George Mueller wouldn't do it that way. Uh, he just expected that God would meet him. <laughs> and in the midst of all that, Michelle's got a far more pertinent question to ask. But just thought I'd throw that in there because we need to smile. God does things in ways we just can't imagine. And that's the neat thing. Yeah, that's so true. I And I, I love what you're saying about joy. And, and as a Christian, I totally relate. Um, but how, how do people at home, how do they get joy? How do Christians get joy when they face difficult circumstances in their lives? And how, how do you find joy amid any pain that you might have? Well, you have to look for it and you have to ask for it. In fact, as I was telling you, I've had a very difficult week this week. And the way I got through it is I said, Lord, I need your joy because your joy is my strength. Would you give me more joy? And you know what? The next thing I knew, 
I felt the joy of the Lord again. And also by reading the word and, and by uh, reading my new book on joy is very helpful because it's prayers made out of the scripture, which is alive in the power of God. And there you are praying the word, God's will back to God, and you're going to have joy. Okay, so let's uh, pick up on that a little bit. I know there's a story where you're flying in a small plane over Texas and you were in sheer terror. Uh, just give us a snippet of that story and how you turned the terror into joy. That's right. I mean, my husband was flying the small plane and we have had several emergency landings in that plane in the past. And now he says to me, we're going to fly from Beaumont all the way to Corpus Christi down the coast. That's 300 miles of wild coastline. There are no cities there because of the hurricanes. It's a wild place. The only thing alive down there besides the crabs are the cows, the wild cows. So now we're flying over the coastline and now I'm looking for where can we make an emergency landing if the engine should conk out? Well, we can't land on the sand. If we do, the nose of the plane will go into the sand and we will flip end over end. We can't land in the water because if we do, the wings will float, but the cab, which we were in, would be underwater. I was petrified. I felt it was my job to look out. And so finally, five hours later, when we got to Corpus Christi, I barely crawled out of that plane. And I looked at my husband and he said, wasn't that a beautiful flight on a beautiful day? And I was like, oh, oh I missed that. I missed it. The next year, I got a, re, a chance to retry the adventure. Here we are again. And this time, I said, Lord, I give you my fear. And I had to practice it more than one time. I'd look out and see a debris on the beach and, oh, no. And then I would say, no, Lord, I'm giving you my fear. And I'm going to enjoy the day. And when we landed in Corpus Christi, I hopped out of the plane and I turned to my husband and I said, wasn't that a beautiful flight on a beautiful <laughs> And he was like, what? Touche. <laughs> okay. I chose, I chose joy and I got joy. Well, interesting. You've written many books, but uh, recently a book on joy. Tell me about the book and where people can find it. Well, I just pulled it out of the box yesterday. Here it is. This cool. is called Time for Joy. And it's, uh, it's a hardcover book. It's scripture powered prayers to brighten your day. And so what I did, I'll just show you. I just found the scriptures to highlight the prayer that I wanted to pray. And then I wrote a beautiful prayer that's a paraphrase of God's word. This one is breaking free from the past. And so all of the prayers are designed to bring you back to joy. And so it has been so much fun to pray these prayers myself because I'm my first guinea pig. <laughs> and I can tell you that they really work. That's amazing. So what, what power do you think uh, do scripture prayers have when it comes to our joy? And how, how do we use the scripture in your book, Make Time for Joy? Well, for one thing, we know that the scripture is alive with the spirit of God. We also know that anything in scripture is God's will. Like if I said to the Lord, I guess it's not your will that joy is my strength. He would be like, oh, that's not the case. My word says, the joy of me is your strength. And you can grab onto that if you want to. It's not a lie. So anything in the word is not a lie. It's the will of God. And that word is a lie. So when we begin to pray the truth of the word and the paraphrase scripture back to God, we are praying in God's will. And we are now praying through the spirit of God. And that's going to impact us deeply because here we are right in God's hand. Wow, that's a, that's a not only very succinct comment that you've made, it's probably where we're gonna have to end it for today, safe in the Father's hands. Through this past summer, through an experience that I went through, I started to sign my emails, it's in the Father's hands, and that's a great place to stay. Uh, Linda, thank you for sharing a little bit of your journey with us and uh, touching our lives. And uh, people can find a copy of your book if they go to Amazon.com uh, or .ca. And uh, we we'll look forward to having you back on the program real soon. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you.
You know, when I listen to the interview that we just had with Linda, many times talking about joy, uh, says, yeah, I want joy. But, you know, Michelle, finding joy sometimes is like trying to nail jello to a tree. <laughs> you know, like, how do you hold on to it? How do you continue? What did you take away? And tell me a little bit about your own journey in choosing joy. Yeah, I really loved a lot of what she said really resonated with me. Um, I think it's how you choose. You choose joy. You choose that um, every single day. And um, I find that working with children and also having my daughter, who's like joy personified every day around me, helps to remind me of that. But um, I really loved what she said so much about leaning into prayer and choosing joy over fear. That really resonated a lot with me. So when you get in a frump, you know, when you get down, I'm sure it's never happened, but just suppose that it did. Uh, how long does it take you to change your trajectory? Um, yeah, I think for everybody it's different. For me, it doesn't usually last long because for me, I, I usually can turn it around pretty quickly just by the people I'm surrounded with as well. I find that that really makes an impact uh, who, you, who you spend your time with and how you choose to find joy that way as well. Yeah, sometimes, you know, you can be around people, though, and it looks like they could uh, suck corn through a corn uh, <laughs> Coke bottle. You know, they just, man, <laughs> baptized in lemon juice or something. They're, they're not the happiest person. Yes. Have you found there's to be like a specific verse in the Bible or a train of thought that really helps to bring you back to that joyful spot? Yeah, I think I just, I just thank God for the miracle that I've been given of, of my life and the fact that I get to be a parent and I get to spread God's love and joy through teaching. Like that's just how I remind myself every day that I'm a vessel of joy as well. So that's very interesting. Yeah. It's not just receiving, yes. but giving it, but giving it. Yeah. That's important to me. I and think in, both ways it was it's equally important. And in this season of my life, I think one of the things I'm called to do actually is to make people laugh a little bit. Yeah, I think that's, See, that's you're important. Laughing. There I you know, go. I have been laughing a lot this time. I think that's important too, even little things like that. Conversations or connections that you have with people bring spark joy as well. So that's yeah. another way you can share joy. We've got to be real and not so full about ourselves. So uh, <laughs> as you're listening today, the perspective, uh, I'm glad you're with us. I'm going to be teaching on joy. So I hope you'll stay with us and we're going to look at what God's antidote is to the sadness, to the being overwhelmed with life as we unpack some truth from the book of Philippians. Stay with us. You know, as much as we're talking about joy, it's quite likely that many of you watching today are dealing with things that will snatch your joy away. Maybe it's an email you've received, perhaps it's been uh, an unkind word or somebody has just tried to, you know, knock your feet out. There's many things that will steal our joy. And how we reclaim that joy is a choice that we make if we learn to rest in the promises of God. I can't work myself into a place of joy, but I can trust myself into a place of joy. When things are dark and I don't understand, I can choose to trust. And if I don't choose to trust, guess what? I am choosing to rust. I'm going to stay in that place. In different times in my own journey, when I've just been overwhelmed, suddenly it'll catch me saying, I'm going into a depression. This is a deep dive. How do I pull myself out? And I go back to the Word of God. And over and over again, I find myself coming to the book of Philippians. Philippians is a book, the theme of which is joy. How to find joy no matter what. Paul wrote it when he was sitting in a, a Roman prison cell, waiting for uh, what he thought was his martyrdom. And so imagine writing a book on joy. If we read the first few verses, we're going to discover what his secret was. So join with me. I want to read from the book of Philippians. And he begins by saying, Paul and Timothy were servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Now, Paul, when he's writing the letter, he, uh, he refers to himself as a servant of Jesus Christ. This guy, he had a healthy perception of himself. And when we choose joy, there are always two choices. You know, we can see the glass is half empty or we can choose to see it half full. But part of what impacts our joy is the way we look at other people. Oh, they're going to rob me of my joy, or they're going to give me something that I desperately want. 
Paul said, and even though he was the preeminent leader at this time in the church, he said, I'm a servant. And he writes a letter to the people he refers to as the saints, those that are in the family of God, those who have chosen to follow God, but he treats them as if they are greater than himself. You know, someone has once said that at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. We are all equal before God. We are brothers and sisters in him. And one of the things that impacts my joy is when I choose to realize that um, I'm part of a family. I'm not greater, I'm not lesser, but I'm part of the family of God. And there are things that can uh, definitely shape the way that I look at life every day. And Paul writes it in the second verse. He says to the church, he's writing, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Those two words uh, were his signature way of beginning his letters, grace and peace. You see, grace reminds us of all that God has given to us, grace for today, grace for tomorrow. It's his saving grace where we are forgiven for our sins. The Bible says it's by grace we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, lest anyone should boast. All that we have is a gift from God. And Paul then writes, he says, grace and peace. Many times when I talk to people, they would say immediately, yeah, I want peace. I want peace in my heart. Well, if you want peace, you need to be embraced by God's grace. You need to say, God, I believe that you love me. I believe you died for me on the cross. I am trusting you. I'm going to choose to trust that you're with me. Part of the powerful story of Linda, uh, as she shared with us, is the fact that she had to choose to trust, even when her daughter was in that coma for over a year. How do you move on with life? How do you keep going? It's when you choose to trust. We can choose joy. And, uh, and that's really the, the friends of joy. It's grace and peace. But the conduit for joy is prayer. We don't have time today, but Paul writes this. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel up to this day. If you've been listening to the programs this week, you realize there's been a recurring theme, whether it's the marriage episode we did or the episode today, is that prayer is critical. Prayer is such a vital part. And as we close today, I want to pray for you. So will you join me? And in this prayer, let's ask God to fill you with his incredible joy. So, Father, I ask today for the people that are watching this program. I pray for those that are listening, that they would hear your heart, that you are with them, you'll never fail them or forsake them, and you will be their friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord, would you fill their lives with your joy right now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so from all of us at The Perspective, from uh, Julie and Mitch and Michelle and myself, we want to thank you for watching today. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And in the meantime, write to us, write to theperspective.tv. We have something we'd love to send you as a gift.